us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. We have a real chance at this new world order. An order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. After 1989, President Bush kept saying, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order, and instead it looks like we got a lot of disorder. It's been a long time coming because of what we did on this day, at this defining moment. Change has come to America. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. The affirmative task we have now is to actually create a new world order. Its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. talk about the New World Order defined, as you have, as being Luciferian. Yes. Um, how do you know that? My investigations led me to look at the back of the American dollar, and I found these strange seals on the dollar here. They're Illuminati seals, which was a secret society set up in 1776 by a man called Adam Weishaupt. And on the back of the dollar here, you see the seal on the left-hand side, and there's an eye in the triangle. It's the eye of Horus in Egyptian mythology, now called the Eye of Lucifer, or Satan. The two words at the top, Annua Chapters, stand for announcing the birth of, and down the bottom, Novus Ordo Seclorum. And that great seal of the United States has on it, Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order. And people should be asking the question, what is an Egyptian pyramid doing on the back of an American dollar? What link-up is there between America and uh, Egypt? The answer is none at all except in the field of the occult. And thus we see we're dealing with a Luciferian plan. And people need to recognize the God of Freemasonry will lead the world into this peculiar and particular purpose for which America was set up, which is to lead the whole world system into a one world government, a one world religion, a one world law system, and a one-world money system that the Bible calls the mark of the beast. And basically what we know for a fact that there is going to be a changeover from the old order to a new order, a rule by Satan himself. That's what that symbol refers to and that's what the new world order refers to. In the King James, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Notice how the New English Bible renders this verse. It says, The old order is gone, and a new order has begun. They're using the same language. The King James says, Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation, talking about Christ's coming, but notice the NIV calls it until the time of the new order. They're preparing people. Now I want you to notice this. In Isaiah 28, 16, in the King James, the Bible says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. This is referring to Jesus, right? And I want you to notice that in the King James, they're telling you that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation. Now where's the foundation in relation to a building? On the top or the bottom? It's on the bottom, isn't it? Okay? So when they say that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation, that's down here, right? Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, this is the King James, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Again, on the foundation. Notice that the NIV calls him the capstone. They're saying that that symbol that you see represents Christ. It doesn't. It represents who? Anti-Christ.
Now there's an agenda today, and it's a satanic agenda to change the Bible. A lot of people just think, well, the King James Bible is a great translation. It's, it's very poetic, and these other versions are inferior. Maybe they're not as well translated. But I'm here to tell you, it goes much deeper than that. These new versions are actually Satan's attempt at corrupting the Word of God. I'm going to show you that these changes are not just accidental. They're not just minor, inconsequential changes. I mean, these changes are strategic changes. They're calculated to attack specific doctrines that the Bible teaches. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are people who have many millions and even billions of dollars who have an agenda to put out corrupted Bibles and then promote them through advertising, promote them through retail stores that will put them front and center and that will show people this is the Bible you ought to be reading. Get rid of the King James Bible. Get the newer, better, improved version. Now, I did some research on what the most popular versions are today. This is the most current list. I checked this with a bunch of different sources, and they all came up with the same five Bibles. The number one Bible today is not the King James Bible. It's the New International Version, the NIV. Number two is the King James Bible. Number three, the New Living Translation. Number four, the New King James. And number five, the English Standard Version, or the ESV. Different lists I looked at had those in a slightly different order, but they... The devil knows that if he can disarm us as Christians, he can defeat us. The goal is and always has been to disarm us of our weapons. Look at this. When evil men want to conquer a group of people, you know what proceeds to conquer? They disarm those people of their weapons. See, the government tries to tell you, we want to remove your weapons because we're going to protect you. you, you know, if someone wants to take your weapon away, they're not trying to protect you. They're trying to make sure that when they come after you, you can't fight back. In 1929, the Soviet Union established gun control. Between 1929 and 1953, 20 million political dissidents were killed. In 1935, Germany established gun control. began to disarm its people. Between 1933 and 1945, 13 million Jews and others were killed. In 1935, China established gun control and began to disarm its people. Between 1948 and 1952, 20 million political dissidents in China were killed. In 1970, Uganda established gun control, began to disarm its people. Between 1971 and 1979, catch this, 300,000 Christians were killed. In 1956, Cambodia established gun control and began to disarm its people. Between 1975 and 1977, one million Cambodians were killed. You gotta understand this. The enemy is constantly trying to take your weapon away, not to defend you, but so that you cannot defend yourself. Evil dictators have always disarmed the population to make them defenseless, to make them slaves. Governments know that if they can disarm the people, they'll be defenseless against their tyranny. Say, so why is there an attack under the Word of God today? Of course there is, because if Satan can disarm you from the one thing you've got to hurt him, from the one thing you've got to engage him in battle, if he can disarm you, then it's easy to do. The devil would love nothing more than to take the two-edged sword of the King James Bible out of our hand and replace it with a butter knife called the NIV. There's a lot in these new Bibles that tamper with end times Bible prophecy in order to prepare people to accept the Antichrist, in order to prepare people to be sucked into this new world order, in order to prepare people to be deceived by this global government, one world religion, one world system of the Antichrist, and to receive the mark of the beast. The pastor, man, as you're going on these conspiracies, you believe in the new world order? You, you think it's crazy to think that there are bankers and people out there trying to bring in a, a one world government? Now, I don't know if you've ever read the book of Revelation, but the Bible tells us that the Antichrist is going to bring in a one world government. The Bible tells us that the Antichrist is going to bring a one world religion. I don't think it's that far-fetched 
that people are saying, oh, the bankers are bringing in a new world order with a one world government, with a whatnot. Now they may think, you know, these conspiracy theory guys, they may think, oh, it's just the bankers, it's just this. But we know in the Bible that the Antichrist is bringing in that same thing. That's what the Bible says. From the Garden of Eden, there's been attack on the Word of God. Even before the Bible was completely written down, there was an attack on the Word of God. And you think it's different today? It's not. You gotta understand this. Today, the Word of God is under attack. The modern Bible versions are clearly different than the King James Bible. And you've got to ask yourself this question, why? In order to understand the difference, you need to understand the history of the English Bible. Turns out there's a Bible museum right here in Phoenix that has one of the largest collections of rare English Bibles in the world. And the museum director, Joel Lamp, is going to let us actually look into these rare first editions of the Bibles leading up to the King James and the King James itself. He's going to explain to us the history of our King James Bible. He's going to take us all the way from Erasmus Greek New Testament, the original Texas Receptus, and he's going to take us through the history of all these English Bibles all the way up to the King James Version. So let's start with Erasmus. What you see here on the table, Pastor, is in a nutshell the history of the King James Bible. Now remember, the King James Bible was printed in 1611, and there's a common misconception out there that it was the first English. Well, it wasn't. There were numerous other English examples before right. 1611. And what you see here starts with the original Greek, as you just said, Textus Receptus, done by Erasmus of Rotterdam. This literally changed everything from what we know today in church history as well as in just secular history. It's called the 1516 Erasmus of Rotterdam's Greek, Latin, New Testament. Well, let's just call Erasmus what he is, the smartest man that ever lived. Okay, non-deity factor. Okay, Jesus, of course, is the smartest man that ever lived. But Solomon's up there as well. But even today, we consider Erasmus the smartest, whether it's in sciences, theology, philosophy. He was just that smart. And this is the original Texas Receptus, right? The original, Receptus, right the here. original Texas Receptus. Wow. Please take a look at it. Generally considered the most important book that was ever printed, and this is the book that launches the Reformation. Even as an atheist, you acknowledge this is the most important book ever printed. The Renaissance is launched from this. The truth comes from this book. And so we see just how imperative this book is, but what it also did was cause an enormity of problems. And what do I mean by that? Well, the money stopped flowing to Rome. There's a building under construction. There's a very famous interior designer down there that was hired to decorate it. Of course, I'm talking about the Vatican, Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel. That money stopped flowing, the church started putting bounties on people's heads, saying, you can't teach this. This isn't what we consider accurate, even though Erasmus said, we kind of got a problem here. It does say, metanoia, not pay a fine. So we're going to have to address this theological issue, but the Protestant movement was birthed from this book. And what does the Protestant movement actually mean? To protest. 